Welcome to the Ultimate Cavs Show Playoff Edition. We're going to give you the Cavs keys to beating the Orlando Magic in the first round coming up in just a sec. Donovan Mitchell's knee has been a problem the entire second half of the season. I talked to him about it last week, kind of went on depth on when it happened, how he's feeling, and what he's expecting for the playoffs. We're going to talk about it. The truth behind Mitchell's knee injury is coming up on the Ultimate Cavalier Show. What's up, guys? Jason Lloyd, Mikey McNuggets, as always, here on the Ultimate Cavalier Show. Jason, we launched this in February, and we said we only got a couple weeks before the playoffs get going, and hopefully we'll be in full swing, full ramp for the start of the playoffs. And I know we are ready. The question is, are the Cavs? Uh, boy, I can't definitively answer that. You certainly hope so. Um. You know, I, I think a lot of it hinges on Donovan's health. We'll get to that a little bit later. I do think he'll be better. You know, you and I have talked about it. I think the rest of the week off could really, really help him the most. Uh, so we'll see. This has been such a wildly inconsistent team this year, man. It's hard to get a read on these guys. It is. And this first round matchup against Orlando presents so many questions and challenges for this Cavs team in a way. It's ironic that Orlando mirrors some of the same things New York did last year. Yeah. And obviously, the Cavs failed that test in colossal fashion. I mean, catastrophic. It was bad. And they do have a chance to redeem themselves in some of their shortcomings from last season in this postseason. Is that enough to keep Donovan Mitchell in town? Is that enough if they win the series to keep J.B. Bickerstaff and Kobe Altman's job safe? We'll discuss that when the time is appropriate. But what we're going to focus on today is what the Cavs have to do to beat the Magic. We're going to draft the 10 best players in the series. We're going to break down some Palo Bancaro film. And we're going to tell you the truth behind Donovan Mitchell's knee injury. But Jason, let's start with this today. And I'll let you go first, and I will follow. What do the Cleveland Cavaliers have to do in this first round series to advance to round two, to beat Orlando, and to put everyone in Cleveland at ease that the sky is not falling inside Rocket Mortgage Fieldhouse? Well, it's funny you mentioned the similarities between Orlando and New York because last year I said it until I was blue in the face and I tweeted it until my fingers hurt. Shooting, 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 shooting. Cavs didn't have it last year. They just didn't have they didn't have the shooting. You have to be able to make shots in the postseason in the NBA. I would argue that it's more important to be a good shooting team than a good defensive team. These are two really good defensive teams. But you have to be able to make shots, particularly open shots for sure, even contested shots. You have to be able to make shots. The Cavs knew it was a glaring weakness coming off last year. That's why they added Max Struess. That's why they added George Niang. Uh, Sam Merrill, it can be a flamethrower when he gets going. I don't know how much he's going to play in this series. But he, you know, he's a guy who can get hot and really get you some, some buckets in a short amount of time. Uh, Isaac Okoro has drastically improved as a three-point shooter. Now we'll see how much... He can stay on the floor. He's got to hit shots to play. And we'll talk about that probably coming up here in a little bit too. Uh, so to me, it's shot making. The Cavs have got to make shots in order to win this series. It sounds simple, but it's really uh, it's much more complex than that. But you got to be able to make shots. It's a make or miss lead. You could say that for every series in the NBA playoffs. And that stands true for the Cavs and the Magic, which is kind of where I want to start, Jason, on my keys for a Cavaliers series victory over Orlando. Before I get to that, I do want to emphasize something. The Cavs may, they may not have ducked, dodged, and intentionally avoided Philly or Miami in the first round. Yeah. The reality is the Eastern Conference is tough. Now you have Boston in its own class, and everyone else is kind of in that middle group. And there is no guarantee that Cleveland's going to roll over Orlando. We'll make our picks later in the show, later in the week. But this is not an easy matchup by any means. And I've seen a lot of people online already penciling Cleveland in to round two. And while right now I am leaning towards picking Cleveland in the series, I do want to emphasize Orlando is no pushover. This is a team that presents a lot of challenges, not just for Cleveland, but for any team they would match up against in the first round of the playoffs. But they do have some shortcomings as well. And this is what I think the Cavs need to exploit in this first round series to advance as the winners. Now, as the producer of the show as well, I make graphics, Jason. So when you go, there's nothing. I made a couple graphics here to throw up while I'm talking. 
Three keys to the victory for the Cavaliers. Pace, rebounding, and most importantly, and I'll start reverse to the top, you got to let Paolo get his, but no one else can go off. Paolo may score 50, that's fine. The rest of the guys on this team, you have to keep in check. Paolo Bancaro is a future superstar in the NBA. Not just a star, not an all-star. He is a guy that's going to have multiple all-NBA team selections on his resume. He's the youngest player in NBA history to lead his team in points, rebounds, and assists in a season. Don't do LeBron when he did it for the first time for the Cleveland Cavaliers. He's a stud. And there are actually a couple shades of the way he plays that remind me of a young LeBron James, Jason, as we go through his numbers this season were incredible, 22.6 points per game, four assists. I mean, this guy was an absolute monster. And what he does, and I'm going to show you guys a video file here in a sec as I ingest it into my computer. My computer froze right before we came on, so it kicked it out. Here it is. We're going to show you this here, guys. Is uh pretty incredible. When he drives right, Paolo is looking to score and get to the cup. When he dribbles with his left hand or goes left, he's going to try a step-back jumper. This isn't rocket science. I did not invent a new scouting report on Paolo Bancaro. This is exactly what every NBA team knows. But at least knowing that with three, four, five days to prepare and then two, three games between, the Cavs can kind of chime in and hone in on exactly what you have to do from a defensive standpoint to keep Paolo Bancaro in front of you. Isaac Okoro had tremendous success defending Paolo Bancaro this season. But at the end of the day, he's a 6'10 freak of nature who will pull up over you. And if you're not strong enough to body him, he's going to take you to the paint like you just saw there. Yeah. This thing's on loop for three minutes, Jason. So I'm just going to talk as this plays. Paolo is an elite scorer in the NBA. He could score more than 23 points per game if Orlando needed him to on a consistent basis. What the Magic don't do well is shoot threes around him. And while Paolo's a fine passer, he's not a LeBron James dissector of defenses like a Luka Doncic is, like a LeBron was, like some of the top-tier offensive creators are in the NBA. And on the flip side, the shooters they are surrounded with in Orlando frankly aren't great. As a team, Jason, this season, the Magic shot 35.2% from deep. That was 24th in the NBA. On catch-and-shoot threes, they shot just 36.9%. That was 21st in the NBA on the 20th most attempts. So they are bottom third in the NBA on catch-and-shoot threes, on catch-and-shoot three percentage, and overall three-point percentage. Take a look at these guys, Jason. Do any of these guys scare you from three? Jason Suggs, Suggs Wendell Carter, Caleb Houston, Gary Harris, Paolo Bancaro. That's Orlando's top shooters yeah. three with at least three three-point attempts per game. So Joe Ingles is on that list. He doesn't shoot three per game. He's at 43%. But these are the guys that you cannot let beat you if you are the Cleveland Cavaliers. Paolo's going to get his. Let me watch the tape. The dude's a scoring machine, but he takes a lot of long twos. He takes a lot of contested shots, and if he's going to make those, tip your hat and a lot can happen. But I don't think the Cavs can allow Paolo to draw the defense in, kick out to open shooters, because I don't trust those guys enough to make shots in a postseason series on a consistent enough basis to beat the Cavaliers' defense. Yeah, I mean, that's the conversation about Isaac, right? Like, it's about Okoro. Can he make pressure shots in the playoffs? It's a lot different in April than February. Well, you can say that about all those guys because this is Orlando's first go-around. I do like Suggs. He's really improved this year as a three-point shooter, really throughout his career. He's taken incremental steps, took a big leap this year. But to your point, I don't know that there's anyone on that list that would strike fear into you, um, you know, in terms of, you, you absolutely – you have to cover him at all times. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, there's no one out there on that team that strikes fear into your heart as a shooter. I agree. All right, my next point, boxing out. Jason, we saw last season in the playoffs against the Knicks. Mitchell Robinson, Julius Randle, Isaiah Hartenstein, they had their way with Jared Allen and Evan Mobley. It was not pretty. You could use whatever terminology you want to use, but it was not good enough to win a playoff series. Orlando – in the similar vein to the way New York was last season, a very, 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 very good rebounding team. They have the second highest defensive rebounding percentage in the entire NBA this season at 73.7%. Orlando second, Cavs are 14th. On the offensive glass, they miss a ton of threes. They do a great job getting their own rebound. They have the seventh highest offensive rebounding percentage in the NBA 
at 29.7%. The Cavs all the way down at 22nd. Rebounding does not just fall on the bigs. It is not just on Jared Allen and Evan Mobley to control the glass and keep Jonathan Isaac and Wendell Carter and Paolo Bancaro and Franz Wagner and his brother Mo off the glass. It's going to come down to Darius. It's going to come down to Donovan. The threes, hopefully you get Dean Wade back in. He's a really underrated rebounder. But we saw last year in the postseason, if you cannot rebound, you are going to get killed by second chance points. You're not going to be able to set up any consistent offense. And that is something I am very worried about from the Cavs perspective. I want to interrupt you for keeping one Orlando off the boards. Does Marcus Morris or T- Tristan Thompson hold a role in this series? Not to start with, but if it doesn't go as planned, absolutely. Yeah, I absolutely. think they do. I, I think Morris is ahead of Tristan right now. It just seems that way. It feels like Marcus nudged ahead of him after they brought him here. Maybe with Tristan with the suspension, they're just not sure. I, I don't know. But it felt, I mean, JB loves Marcus Morris. Mm-hmm. I think one of those guys, and right now I put my money on Marcus, one of those guys is going to have an impact in the series for exactly what you're just talking about. Cavs had no bigs off the bench last year in that Knicks series because Dean was hurt. And now look, here we are again, and Dean's hurt. Uh, I don't know what's going on with his knee. He's been rehabbing it. I, I, I don't have a very clear update. I'm still kind of poking around on that. Yeah, Dean's really important to what they do defensively, shooting. If he can't go... You really need Morris Thompson, one of these guys. Mm -hmm. You're going to be in the exact same position you were in last year when you had no real big bigs off the bench. And my last key to victory was push the pace. And Jason, here's why, in my opinion, this might be the single most important thing the Cavs have to do offensively. JB says they don't want to play fast, but they want to play hurried. They want to get, or they don't want to play hurried. They want to play fast. Excuse me. They want to get the ball across half court, see what you can do. It's all tied together because it starts with defensive rebounding. But in the half-court sets, Orlando's defense is tremendous. They had the third-best uh, defensive rating in the entire NBA this season, 110.8. Jalen Suggs, if you're unfamiliar with who he is, you will be very familiar with who he is by the end of the series. He might be the single-best point-of-attack on-ball defender in the entire league from the guard position. That guy is an absolute dog and can take out any guard in the entire NBA. He made Dame Lillard look like he was playing quicksand in their final regular season game, held them to two for 14 from the floor. Well, the Magic did, but Jalen Suggs was a big part of that. They also have Jonathan Isaac, who's coming off injury, who, when he plays, might be the single best defensive weapon in the entire NBA. 6'10", 7'4", wingspan, athletic, bouncy, really, really intelligent defensively. That's a guy that nobody knows about that Cavs fans are going to find out about because he's always hurt. He's constantly hurt. When he plays, he's been really, really effective this season, and had he played enough, He'd be a first-team All-NBA defensive guy without question, and I'm very curious to see where he falls in our draft, Jason. We'll do this in a little bit. But I do not like the Cavs' chances of scoring on a consistent basis against this half-court defense from the Orlando Magic. Orlando likes to play slow. They have the 27th slowest pace in the entire NBA. That makes sense. They don't have a true traditional point guard. They want Paolo to kind of see what's happening, get his long twos, create offense like that. So how do you counteract a great Half-court defense where you get out in transition, make them cross-match off the get-go, and then hopefully when you run your sets and they start switching, well, you have an advantageous switch then at that point to take advantage of. So my three keys, Jason, push the pace, you better rebound, and if Palo beats you, so be it. But you can't let the other four guys on the court be the ones that break the Cavs back when it comes down to crunch time. Brilliant. I said make shots, and then you just went on a 12-minute dissertation. (laughs) So you can see who did more prep work for this. <laughs> I don't have I don't have two kids that need constant attention and an injured <laughs> wife right now. So I have a little more time. All right, Jason, we're going to move on to our draft after a quick word from Monopoly Go. I'm a competitive person. I know you're a competitive person. And that means there's a good chance we jump in on the Monopoly Go bandwagon coming soon. All of us have competitive sides. And that's why we're big fans of Monopoly Go. By now, I'm sure you've heard of it. It's been downloaded over 150 million times. It's a great twist on Monopoly where you play on not one, but hundreds of different boards in crazy locations, building up amazing cities that bring you money. And the best part is messing with your friends. You can charge them rent on iconic properties, just like classic Monopoly, but you can also rob their vaults of riches for yourself. And the leaderboards show you who the biggest Monopoly tycoons are. It's not just my competitive side that loves it. You can team up with friends and people all around the world for time tournaments to earn huge rewards. So get in the game, join your friends, download Monopoly Go now free on the Apple Store or on Google Play. 
Jason, we've done this during football season as we gear up for each matchup on Sunday. We've never done this for basketball, and we are going to do this now, and then I'm going to let Bull, Jay, and G. Bush do this Friday and see how our list compares to their list. I like our odds better than theirs. I I do too, but we are going to draft the 10 players in the series you want the most. You can call it the 10 best players, however you want to title this. It's hard to frame. Like You could frame this a bunch of different ways. Right, like you could frame yeah. the ten most talented players. You could frame this to ten players you want in this series, which not necessarily doesn't mean depending best. Depending on fit, you know, yeah. are, you, are you trying to draft your five best, my five versus your five? There's a bunch of different ways to look at this. Well, we're going to draft ten players total, so it's not my five versus you five. We're just going right. to draft the ten players in this series. Jason Lloyd and Mikey McNuggets want the most to have. On I said side. on the show today. I have to admit. The Cavs came out better than this than I thought that they would. I said on the show today they'd have the number one player, and then I wasn't sure where I would put him again. I, I actually, I when I really sort of dug in a little bit, I was I was pleased with how high the I, I had the Cavs, and I thought I would. I am very confident my top three is the right top three. Okay, outside of the top three, I'm open to hearing a lot of different ideas. And real quick before you go, Jason. There's a chat component to this in StreamYard where we are recording this this podcast. I do not have that open at the moment because I get very distracted by it. I see there's 166 comments. We will go through those at the end, read a couple, but I want to know how you guys would rank the top five players in the series. The I got five it. guys, not the most talented, the five guys yeah. you would want on your team for this series, just like we do it for football season. So leave us a comment. We'll get to those at the end. But Jason, if we agree on a pick, We'll give one sentence. We'll move on. When we disagree, we'll give a little back and forth to see if we come to some kind of conclusion. So I think the first two are pretty obvious. Donovan Mitchell yep. is the best player in the series. Yep. Any reason to believe he wouldn't be? No. I had him as my number one. That was that was easy. Me too. We had him as the number one last year, though, and look how that turned out. That is true. Uh, is Paolo Bancaro your number two player yes. in the series? Yes, I have Paolo too. So I said I was confident in my three. I, I am not. Com- I was confident in one and two, and after this, it's a cluster. You know what? As far as I'm concerned, I, I had Jared I, Allen I, at number three. Surprising. Huh? I had Jared Allen at number. That's three. who I have. So we're confident in number three. Here's I don't my- think you'd have Jared Allen three, but I, I, I had Jared three. You go first. Why did you put Jared third? Because he's been more effective this year on the floor for the Cavs. He's been more important. I thought I might have uh, a magic player three and maybe even four. And then when I really started to dig in, I was like, no, no, Jarrett, Jarrett to me, he's a pillar to what they do defensively. Evan's obviously very good defensively too, but Jared Allen seems to be a tent pole to what they do defensively. He's, and, and I mean, listen, this guy had the worst series of anybody last year, the worst series. And now we're calling him the third most important here, but he's, he's bounced back with a terrific year and I'm confident. Well, I'm not, I'm as confident as I can be at putting him three, but this whole order, I think, is jumbled after two. I think you could make a case for a couple different guys. I went with him at three, and I didn't think much of it, I'll be honest. Because the Magic players who I have on my list, and there's a couple more coming, are unproven in the playoffs, Yeah, which Jared Allen he is, is as well. <laughs> which he is as well, but that kind of negates it. I couldn't say, well, he played terrible in the playoffs last year. Well, I don't know how these guys are going to play. Right. I think up to this point, Jared Allen has done everything he humanly possibly could to redeem himself from last postseason shortcomings. Now, is that enough to erase what happened against New York? No. But you can only do what you can do up until the point you are at at the current present time. And to this point, he had a tremendous regular season. He was right in the all-star discussion. He's the only player outside of Donovan and Paolo who was even on the fringe of the all-star discussion. Yeah. And in my opinion, I can't imagine what happened against New York last season happens again. We've spoken to him Almost every game for the last three weeks, Jason, he understands the magnitude of what's at stake. He understands the perception of this team, the reality of what happened, and he seems committed to kind of changing that narrative. And he said against Indiana after that game, the only way we can change it is by our actions. That's right. He's right. And words are not actions. But the fact that he's acknowledging the fact he understands that's what has to happen to change this soft label around this team gives me at least a little bit of hope that he'll be the one leading the charge to kind of change that perception. So we have the same first three. Donovan one, Paolo two, Jared Allen three. Yep. Jason, who'd you go with at number four? Evan Mobley. I went with a different guy. I went with Darius Garland. I have Darius much lower. On Can I tell list. you why I went Darius yeah. four? I think I know Mobley. why what you're going to say, but go ahead and say it. 
So I have concerns that against this Orlando defense, you can play too big. This half-court defense is too good on Orlando's side. They're too big. I think you need spacing to try and spread them out. Darius, I loved what I saw at the end of the Indiana game. He turned away Donovan Mitchell on a play that I'm still convinced was drawn up for Donovan. I don't care what he says. I know what my eyes tell me. Hits the step back three for the winner. That gives him some confidence moving in. He has been so up and down, and maybe I'm a little too high on Darius, but I also, for this series, guys I want for this series, I'm not quite sure how a non-shooting forward fits in against an Orlando defense that is long, lanky, athletic. I just don't. I don't know where Evan fits. So for that reason, I had to drop him a little bit lower, and I went with Darius at four. Well, I went Evan at four because, again, I'm, I base this on the 10 most talented players I want on my team. And yeah. for that, and given the year, Evan Mobley, now, now the shooting has not come around. But I think sometimes w- w- it's swinging too far the other way. Evan Mobley had a terrific year. He did. He had a really, he really good year. He's on my list, by the way. He yeah. is on my list. Yeah. Now the three point shot has not developed to the point. Oh, I have a, I have a sneaking suspicion he's going to hit some threes in this series, uh, some big time threes. We'll see. I hope you know. I also said Mike Miller was going to win the Cavs a playoff game. So what do I know? And Danny Green was going to save the Cavs at some. Point. No, I'm not. No, 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 no. Don't you do that to me. I said they had to play him because he at least had the ability to make shots. That's what I said. I died on the Mike Miller Hill, but the Danny Green was just a, you got to have somebody out there who can spread the floor and stretch the floor and make shots. And Danny could do that, but he did not end up helping them last year either because he was playing on one leg. Uh, but Mobley to me is incredibly talented. And I just think he had a better year across the board than what he gets credit for. And and I'm just like, hand up. I, I made a big deal about this too. You got to shoot threes in order to stay on the floor with Jarrett. You're right. And I don't know, and it may just be another where they're alternating these guys like they did during the season for for much of the season. But Evan Mobley is too good and too talented of a player not to have an impact on this series. I had to put him number four. So I had Mobley six. Where'd you have Darius? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So Evan gets the four spot by the aggregate score. Oh wow! Okay, because you, I had, I had you had four and six for Mobley, and it was four and seven. So he had. One less point, which means okay. Evan Mobley gets the four spot. And real quick, just on Darius, I just – he's been too inconsistent this year. He's made terrible decisions at big-time moments. He's dribbling way too much, and I just don't trust him right now, and I don't trust a shot. And I said – you and I disagreed on this. I said in February, I don't know if you can have him on the floor at closing time right now. And right now, I think I stand by that. He did hit a big shot at the Indiana. You're right. And we're going to get as part of the Donovan conversation why that was such a big deal. Uh, but he's just been too inconsistent. Now, if he gets it going early and he has a big game, obviously that changes. The you know playoff games are moment by moment. Mm-hmm. You can't sit here and script out what's going to happen in the forty third moment. Who's going to be on the floor in the forty fourth moment of the playoff game? It's more feel and hot hand than any time any other time of the year. But I just right now, as we sit here today, I don't have a lot of faith in Darius Garland right now. So to recap our top four, Donovan Mitchell, one, Paolo Bancaro, two, Jared Allen, three, Evan Mobley, four, and Jason, I put this guy at number five, Jonathan Isaac. Yeah. Defensive Swiss Army knife. He's coming on strong towards the end of the regular season. He hit a couple threes against Milwaukee in their uh, regular season finale. What he does defensively, his ability to switch against a pick-and-roll happy Cavs offense, he could guard truly one through five. I think his ability defensively is the single most valuable asset left on the board. It feels crazy to pick a guy who's averaging like 20 minutes per game as the fifth player you'd want in the series. But I think his ability to shut down anyone from Darius to Jared Allen to Donovan Mitchell, Evan Mobley in between. I I went with Jonathan Isaac at five, and I'm probably crazy for putting him that high, but I put Jonathan Isaac at five. I had him six. Who'd you have five? Uh, Jalen. Jalen Suggs. I have so sucked they, fifth because I because I believe in I just got done saying there's no one that strikes fear in you is the heart of a of, of the three point shooter but his shot has come around it's funny he's sort of that Okoro blood piece for them yeah right yeah, like he's so. he's a defensive lockdown stalwart no one I don't know if anyone really believes that the shot is real or not but we're about to find out like was never a great three point shooter until this year really sort of emerged and in fact I think if you look at the percentages. I don't know about catch and shoots, but I think overall percentage, 
Suggs and Okoro are almost identical. Pretty similar. I think. Yeah. And three pretty, just, just around 40%. So I had sugged a little lower, by the way. So Isaac's in it. If you had him at six, I had, I had, uh, I had J, yeah, I had Isaac six. I had Suggs five and Isaac six. I have Suggs at eight. So off aggregate, that means Isaac will round out our top five, which has three calves and two magic players. Nice. Jason, I already told you I had Darius Garland four. I think you had him six. Uh, or you had him seven, seven. So this is the Garland versus Suggs, then Let, let's debate it. Garland versus Suggs. I had Garland ahead of Suggs. You had Suggs ahead of Garland. Uh, tell me why first. Defensive component. Ahead of Garland. Just the defensive component of Suggs. Uh, I think he can make life miserable on Donovan. And that, that was really the tipping point. I don't trust Darius on offense. Mm -hmm. He's not good enough defensively. I don't know that I fully – I'm talking out both sides of my mouth, I feel like. I don't know that I totally trust Suggs as a three-point shooter, but he has certainly improved. There's no question. And what he gives them defensively, and his ability to put to go on Donovan, um, one out for me. So I love the Ryan Rosillo podcast and his head producer, Sir Rudy, who's a big Orlando Magic fan. And on multiple occasions throughout the season, Sir Rudy threw out his dream scenario of the Magic trading a bunch of assets for Darius Garland. So based off that logic alone, if the Magic and a diehard Magic fan and someone who I think is pretty intelligent when it comes to talking about the Orlando Magic, yeah is using their dream scenario of getting a point guard like Darius Garland to pair with a Jalen Suggs. That kind of gave me the nudge. On top of that for Darius, in the playoffs, when and we saw it last year. This is the perfect example against the Knicks. They blitzed Donovan every single time he was in a pick and roll. Yeah. And the best way to beat a blitz, kick it back and let the other person, other guard, whoever it is, your outlet, go four on three against the defense. And if Orlando who doesn't have to, by the way, because Jalen and Jonathan Isaac are that good defensively. They can. Try I don't to think they will. I don't think up. they will. Yeah. If they, do, if they do decide to blitz, then I trust Darius going four on three more than I trust Jalen Suggs' offense. Suggs is so hot and cold, and yeah. he's gotten much better this season. Like he was – I don't want to say he was being written off before this season, but his stock was at not a very good point before the year. He's had a better season, but at the end of the day – Jalen Suggs averaged 12 and 3, 12, 3 and 1, 2, Jason. I mean, Darius still averaged 18 and 6. It was an ugly 18 and 6, and we yeah. expect more from it, him, but that's why I went with Darius. I, I should probably him. explain myself because if you ask me if 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 I want if I need a player for a regular like if I'm picking a player for a team for a season, I'm taking Darius Garland over Jalen Suggs. But in a playoff series, mm -hmm. with the way that Jalen can defend and with as bad of a year as Darius has had. That's why I put Suggs ahead of him. In the totality, in the totality of a career, I think Darius is going to bounce back and be fine. Yeah. So I, I would take Darius Garland as a player over Jalen Suggs, but for the purpose of this exercise in this series and what they're the way they're playing right now and what they provide right now, I give Suggs the edge. So I'll end it with this, and then we can decide where we go. Just like Isaac last season, Jason, will the Cavs guard Jalen Suggs, or will they play four and five on a defensive standpoint against Orlando? Are they going to need Jalen Suggs to prove he can make his shot before they guard him? And if the answer is yes, I feel like we have to go Darius, and I'll, I'll concede Jalen's probably the next guy. Uh, that's, a, that's a great question that I hadn't considered because the only guy that you would double off him for is Bancaro. Who else on that team are you doubling off Suggs to guard? Well, I mean, Franz Wagner had a terrible shooting season this year. He shot just 28% from three, but he's a much better player and a much better shooter than the than the traditional numbers indicate. Are you really going to uh, lay off a guard? No, though, double him. No, I'm not. I'm not doubling Franz to lay off Suggs. I don't think, right. frankly, I'm not doubling anybody or not leaving anybody one on one to double Bancaro. I think if they're going to beat you, you have to let those guys beat you. So I'm not sure if that's the strategy Cleveland will go with defensively. If I was running the show, that's how I would go. But yeah, if you are going to help off. I mean, Wendell Carter shot 34% from three. It's hard to double a big from big to big. Right. You have Franz Wagner, who, you know, shot 21, 28% from three. It's 10% lower than Suggs, but I think he's probably a better overall shooter. I will concede to you and go Darius and then Suggs. I'll concede that. I'm fine with that. So then we got two more spots, uh, three more spots, Jason. Before we give it out, before we give it out, this is for eight, nine, and 10. On your list, how many Magic players do you have in this final three? One. Me too. Is it Franz Wagner? Yeah. Where'd you I have him? him? Next. I have him I, I had him next as well. Eighth. That was easy. Is, 
His numbers are good, 19 points, five rebounds, a decent playmaker. His shooting percentages were down. Uh, Milwaukee was playing like five feet off him in the regular season finale. They were giving him the legit Isaac Okoro treatment last year. Yeah. But I trust the talent, 20-point-per-game score. He's their second option offensively, and he's a pretty good defender. So uh, I think Wagner falls in there. I'm very curious to see how you went 9-10 and 10 for the Cavs. Uh, I went Struess 9, Max Struess 9, and Isaac Okoro 10. Dead ass. Can you see my phone? That's exactly, you have the same thing? exactly how I did it. Yeah, that's Struess really 9, funny. Isaac 10. Yeah. Here, you tell us why Struess is 9. I'll tell you why Okoro is 10. Struess is 9 because of – what he can do offensively. He may not be a great shot maker, but he and Donovan have this pick and roll action that they've run at times this year. That's really hard for teams to, to guard and they get great success out of it. He's got the playoff experience, obviously the postseason experience that they didn't have last year. Uh, and so I just, I, I, I didn't even have him on the list at first, to be honest. And the more I thought about it, really it was this postseason success that put him on the list for me and jumped him over Okoro. And it's funny because basically Struess is brought here to replace Okoro, uh, if we're being honest. And and yet Isaac still makes a list, obviously, for his defensive ability. But I couldn't leave Struess off. They brought him here for this purpose, mm -hmm. for postseason games, to be that guy, to be the guy that, that doesn't get rattled, that stays cool. Uh, and, and I just think what he gives them offensively, despite not being maybe a prolific three-point shooter, is enough to put him ninth on this list. I also put him ninth because I think he's a better defensive player than Isaac Okoro is an offensive player. Plus his offense is crucial in his shooting ability. Yeah. Two numbers that stand out for Isaac Okoro, by the way. He's obviously increased his three-point shooting. But against the Magic this season, there may not have been a better individual one-on-one -on -one defender against Paolo Bancaro than Isaac Okoro. In nearly 12 minutes of action against each other as his primary defender, over the course of four games this season, he held Paolo to six points on two of 10 shooting and forced a turnover. He stole the ball from him. Uh, we mentioned earlier, Paolo is a monster. I cannot emphasize that enough. If you are unfamiliar with Paolo Bancaro's game, you will be very familiar soon enough wow. because that yep. guy is going to be a stalwart and a stud across this league. You're going to be familiar in about two time. weeks. About two yeah. weeks, you're going to be familiar with him. But Isaac did a tremendous job staying in front of him, forcing him into tough shots. And all you could do against a guy like Paolo, who's 6'10, strong, athletic is contest. Make him shoot over. You can't give him easy looks, and Isaac made him work for all his buckets in those four contests. So to recap our top 10, Jason, and I can't believe we had as many similarities as we did. <laughs> we had Donovan 1, Paolo Bancaro 2, Jared Allen 3, Evan Mobley 4, Jonathan Isaac 5, Darius Garland 6, Jalen Suggs 7, Franz Wagner 8, Max Struess 9, and Isaac Okoro 10. We will compare those answers to how Bull, G, and J do on Friday. Friday. We're going to take one more break before we get into the secret behind Donovan Mitchell's knee injury and a quick word from FanDuel. It's playoff time in the NBA and hockey. Baseball's in full swing, and FanDuel is your place to bet on every single game. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets. Guaranteed, that's $150, bucks, win or lose. You can bet on everything from slap shots to home runs to slam dunks, all on the app that is safe, secure, and easy to use. So what are you waiting for? Visit FanDuel.com slash UCSS and make your first bet an automatic win. FanDuel is America's number one sports book. Jason, you wrote a tremendous article on it. You talked to Donovan in the locker room after the Indiana game and got some answers to the question a lot of Cavs fans have been asking for about two and a half months now. What the hell really happened to Donovan Mitchell's knee and how did he get hurt? And you were the first reporter to get the actual answer so please inform us all, enlighten us all, and give us some clarity on Donovan's right knee. Yeah, I was just confused as to how it all happened because he looked fine. And I told him, you look fine at All-Star to me. Like, you, you looked all right to me. You didn't really notice anything. And all of a sudden, he comes back from All-Star. And at first, it was they were given a couple extra days of rest. And then it was, I think they said he was sick or something. And then it was, then it came out about this knee thing. And it just, it just wasn't added up. It just didn't make sense. And so I just said, like, what what is going on with this thing? And he said, and I tweeted this out. You can find it on uh, my Twitter account. I tweeted out the video on at by Jason Lloyd. And I'm working on getting it right now for you, Jason. He said he knew exactly when it was. He said two minutes left in the game. Chicago, if you remember back, the Chicago game at home was the last game before the All Star break. And about two minutes left, he went into it. He was at the free throw line. 
he went into a deep bend like he always does. And he sort of like grimaced. He sort of flinched and grimaced. And you can see it clear as day in the video. And he said that was the first time he felt it. He didn't think anything of it. He just thought he was tired, you know, sore, long game, long first half of the season, whatever. He would be fine. And clearly I have, was, I have the video, Jason. You want me to play it for you? Yeah, go ahead and play it. And you, you could can talk, you could talk over it. It'll just loop. You could see clearly where where the flinch comes uh, when he goes into the bend right there. That little hitch is when he said that's the first time that he felt the knee and tried to play through it, took a couple of days off, come back from all-star, tried to play through it. And he said it was the Washington game when he said he was dragging his leg up and down the court. And he felt like, what am I doing? Like, I'm not helping anybody out here. And he still tried to play two more games after that. And then he finally shut it down again. I think that's when they did the PRP injection. Uh, and it's just been bothering him. It's just tendonitis. He said it just, it's just tendonitis and the best thing for it is rest, which is why, you know, you and I have both said, we've said on the show that I, I think he's going to be okay by the time the playoffs begin this week off. You know, I think who was it? Jay was trying to make the point. We'll sit him against Indiana and then play him against Charlotte. That didn't that make made no sense. sense. No, that didn't make any sense. Play him against Indiana. The big playoff it could have been a playoff post or a pre, uh, preview. preview. It could have been a playoff preview game. Win that game, get everything locked up that you can get locked up, and then sit them and give them this big block of time off, and and that's that's how it worked out for them. So by the time they roll out the balls on Saturday, he I would imagine he'll be as good as he's been uh, since since certainly since the knee with with all this time off. He should be. He felt like he was turning the corner already toward the end of the Indiana game. And the thing that was important, the, the only other nugget I would leave off of that is the fact that you know I've said it all year. They got to play left-handed. You can't just expect Donovan to bail you out. Donovan is not for as good as he is, and he's a wonderful talent. He's not the type of player that's going to carry a franchise through a postseason series. That's been proven. His team has lost in the first round for the last five years. He needs help. He's not LeBron. He's not Giannis. He's not a guy who's going to strap a team on his back and win series after series after series. So you've got to find a way to win without him at times, and that's why – you know, the two biggest possessions of that Indiana game, he didn't touch the ball. And he told me he was exhausted. He said he was flat out exhausted by that point. Darius hits the big three, and then Darius to Struess on the action, and Struess is fouled shooting a three-pointer, makes two of the three threes, and Donovan was not involved. That's really important, I think, because they have to – and Donovan said, like, that's something for them to build off of now. And, 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 and when I talked to him last year about this, I said, would you ever punt a game – just to send a message to the team of like, figure out how to do this without me. And he said, no, absolutely not. I have to win every game I play. And then when I was talking the other night, he said, I had some things to learn too. And I had growth to do too. And now he feels differently about it. Now he kind of sees what I was talking about, about let these guys do it without you. And the last thing, it's funny because I've said it, you know, for two years, it, the first thing you do, and you said it earlier, Blitz Donovan, it's what the Knicks did. Blitz Donovan, get the ball out of his hands. Okay, now what do you have? And the Cavs didn't have anything else in their bag. Orlando is the one team yeah. that may not do that. Like, they'll just play straight up. They'll put Suggs on Donovan, have Jonathan Isaac behind him, and say, okay, big boy, what do you got? Then that's the one team. It's interesting because I've said all along, like, they're going to – you blitz Donovan, get the ball out of his hands, and now you're forcing somebody else to make a play. Orlando, I'm curious to see how they guard him because they may not do that. Uh, I know you got to run in a sec, Jason. So I'm going to read all. You can leave at in two minutes. Yeah, I'm going to. I'm going to stick on and read a bunch of comments because we have over 300. I'm not reading all 300. Also, <laughs> shout to you guys. Our most live views we've had on a uh, Ultimate Cab Show since we've debuted. So we appreciate you guys tuning in. Hopefully, you enjoyed. If you do, hit the like button, subscribe. As always, seeing Donovan in person over the last two weeks, Jason. We saw him against Indiana, and that game in particular. We also saw him a little bit against Memphis. He looks so much more comfortable going laterally than he did during the West Coast road trip. Now, granted, we were watching the West Coast games on TV. The other two were up close personal, seeing it in person. But his lateral quickness and his ability to shift side to side looks pretty close to Premier Donovan. Yeah. And against Indiana and Memphis, according to my unofficial track record, which is my memory, I think he was like 7 of 8 or 7 of 9 on pull-up threes going to his left. Just a little something to notice. He looked very, very comfortable off pick and rolls, dribbling with his left hand, one, two, step, pull, make. Yeah. His explosiveness towards the rim. Vertically, it's still not there. 
And maybe it will be after 10 days off, nine days off, whatever it is, before game one against Orlando. But that's the part of his game that's still not back. But laterally speaking, which is maybe not equally as important as your verticality, but pretty damn important, especially on the defensive side of the ball. Yeah, He looked to be back to pretty close to where he was prior to being hurt. And maybe if he's at 80%, 85, whatever the number is, it's all arbitrary. If he has the ability to shift side to side and get through small creases in the defense, which would be especially difficult against this long, athletic Orlando defense, him getting in, creating them, and forcing them to collapse and kicking out to the shooters, which is exactly what I want Cleveland not to do defensively against Orlando, I think is a key to beating a defense that is that compact and that tight like yep. to play. So and one of the the point, is, they need him to be healthy, obviously. Yeah. But I thought the Indiana game, he looked as good as he had looked physically since he hurt himself prior to the All-Star break. And one other point, early these first these early round games, this first round games, there's multiple days off. Usually yep. we haven't seen the full schedule. A lot of times you get two, maybe even three days off in between games. So that will help him obviously with recovery sure. as well. Jason, if you want to stick around, anything else you want to add before we uh, wrap up? I'm going to read a bunch of these comments here. Yeah, I got a roll. I, I got a roll, so I'm going to go. But uh, it was good. Good, good, good show. Appreciate you. As always, Jason, he'll be back on the UCSS show on Monday. No, Thursday. on Thursday. Thursday. I'll be there Thursday. So, Jason, you can leave. Let's, we've never done this live, so you leave. Let's see how this works, and I'm going to read some comments here All right, at the end of the wrap-up. Later, guys. Bye. All right, that was Jason Lloyd. We have over 200 comments. I'm not going to read all of them. I'm going to read a couple here as I go through. I appreciate you guys for tuning in. I'm going to do my best to get to all of these or as many as I can. And as always, make sure you all like, subscribe, leave a review. Hey, tweet at me if you disagree with something I say. If you agree with something I say, let me know about it, and we can talk at MLukesTV. Uh, let's start. We got Real Within with Cavs in five. Freddie says, Cavs in six. Magic slow, can't shoot threes. Freddie says, we got snipers. Real Within says, Morris needs to play in this series. I don't know when. There's going to be a game. I'm telling you, there's going to be a game where Tristan Thompson and Marcus Morris have a significant impact on the outcome of the game. It may be a tumultuous situation they come into because Jared Allen or Evan Mobley are in foul trouble or, God forbid, they get hurt. But I have a feeling Marcus Morris is going to make a couple big shots in this series one way or another. Freddie B says, should I go to game three or game four? Uh, game four. Chance to close them out. Game four, as always. Let's keep scrolling. Uh, Phil says, the season was inconsistent. So weird. Uh, Freddie says, being healthy over playing well going into the playoffs. I can see both sides of that argument, but it is true. Health at the end of the day matters more than anything else. If Donovan's not healthy, you have no chance. Uh, what else we got here? What else we got here? Hmm. <laughs> uh, Evan says, damn, that water looks good. Jason definitely has filters in his house. Uh, Jason does have a water filter. Jason's house is very, very, very nice. I can attest. There's a lot of comments. You guys are absolutely flooding us today. I appreciate that. Uh, Mike J says, in my opinion, the Magic are the East Kings. Very different. The Kings can score. They can't play defense. The Magic, well, they are offensively challenged, defensively not so much. Some random dude, Anthony, says, better read than Bull. You better believe it, Anthony. 407 KHMER says, Magic in six. Here we go. Here's the top five. Freddie B said, Spider, Bancaro, Allen, Mobley, DG. That was four of our top five. Evan said Mitchell, Bancaro, Allen, Suggs, DG. Uh, that's three of our five, but the same top three across the board. Um, here's Evan saying most of the comments not related to the show, Mike. You don't worry about it. I'm glad I saw this now and not way further or back. Could have saved me some time. Uh, what else do we got? What else do we got? You're right, Evan. A lot of these are not Cleveland related. Not, or not, not Cleveland related, but not show related. Uh, Arish Ali says Franz is number three. What? No, Franz was not number three. We had him at number eight. Number eight. Uh, Freddie B says Mobley's going to beat the hell out of them Germans. That is the Wagner brothers, Franz and Mo. By the way, Mo Wagner can play too. Like they, they both can play. They are absolutely not 
Uh, they are not stiff. They absolutely can play. Soul Train says the big this difference between the two teams offensively is that Orlando doesn't have a guard that can take over and get 30-plus like Donovan Mitchell. That is true. The Cavs do not have a Paolo Bancaro, though. Uh, Evan says, how long should the leash be on Okoro? What if his shot isn't falling, but he's containing Paolo? If Isaac is not contributing offensively, but his defense is up to par, then you have to abandon the two-big lineup. You can't play three non-shooters. That is a non-negotiable. Under no circumstances can you play three non-shooters. So if Isaac is not making shots, and you'll find pretty quickly in this series whether he's making shots, whether he's up to the challenge and ready for the bright lights of the playoffs or not, if he is not making shots, then either Jared or Evan has to go to the bench to keep him in the game. It's a non-negotiable. It, you cannot play three non-shooters. It is impossible to win. You saw it against the Knicks last season. Freddie B says, give me Niang over Wade. Uh, Wade's not healthy right now, so we got to see. We do know Niang is not gun shy, but it'll be uh, interesting to see how much he plays throughout this series. He has plenty of playoff experience. The bright lights are not going to be an issue for him. He's been there a ton of different times. Soul Train said, I think Jonathan Isaac is going to make an impact for Orlando. He's going to play a lot more in the playoffs. Jason and I both agree with that. Adam says, Isaac is so underrated with his perimeter defense. He has been putting Dame Lillard in absolute hell the last couple of seasons. When Jonathan Isaac is healthy, he is without question a top five defender in the NBA. His versatility is incredible. He can guard literally point guards to centers, long, lanky, athletic, Smart. He has everything you want in a really good defensive player. An, an elite weapon. Seriously, an elite weapon from the defensive side of the court. Ian says, in a series like this, that'll be a lot of defense and attrition. It'll come down to shot making, which favors the Cavs on paper. I completely agree. Ian. Uh, let's see. Great topics, but please, for the sake, update your downtown picture. What downtown picture? Ronnie, if you're still here, what downtown picture are you talking about? I got three banners behind me in a brick wall. I'm not quite sure what you're talking about. Oh, is it Jason's downtown picture behind him? Hey, whatever Jason spends money on, Jason spends money on. I'm not, uh, not quite sure. But I definitely don't have a downtown picture behind me. Phil says it has to be Donovan Mitchell, but if it has to be organic, if it makes sense, we keep for if we keep forcing it, he will struggle. Mr. King says Cavs better turn up in the playoffs. Winnable matchup for sure. Soul Train says Cole Anthony is inconsistent, but I wouldn't be shocked if he helps the Magic's bench. He is really good. Like, as a bench player, he's a really good guy. Averages 11 points per game off the bench. Pretty good three-point shooter, a good creator. Helps get the Magic into their offensive sets. Uh, definitely a guy to keep an eye on. Couple of last ones here. Uh, 409 says Magic in six. Foyle Bowman says Cavs in four. Evan says Cavs in six. I'm leaning towards Cavs in six. I'll make my official prediction on Friday. I do think the Cavs will win this series. At the end of the day, I said this before, I'll say it again. I believe Donovan's the best player in the series. I think the Cavs have a more talented roster. I think they have more playoff experience, and they have home court advantage. That is the recipe and the formula to advancing in the NBA playoffs. They have all the pieces in place to advance. Now, if you want to argue winning run one round isn't enough advancement for a team of this Caliber, fair. I'm not going to disagree. That's a whole different argument. But the pieces are in place, and there's no excuses why this Cavs team should not beat the Orlando Magic, who are a valuable and formidable opponent. But I do not think they are on the same level of the Cleveland Cavaliers just yet. I truly appreciate all you guys tuning in. We may do some live reaction post-game shows from the Cavs Magic series once we find out game times. We'll definitely do them for the road games, the home games. I know I'll be there and Jason will be there, so it may be tough to go live right after, but we will see how the series unfolds. Let's hope it's a positive, energetic, and emphatic series win for the Cleveland Cavaliers. I truly appreciate you guys tuning in. Like I said, this was a new record for a live show. Tell your friends, tell your family, tell your family's cousins, tell everyone you know to make sure you all tuning in, and we will continue to bring you guys what we think is the best Cavaliers content on the interweb on a weekly basis, and hopefully more now as the Cavs are in the postseason. We may get two shows in a week depending on how the games lie out, but we appreciate y'all tuning in for real. Thank y'all for making this so fun. Let's keep our fingers crossed for a Cavs series win. They should. I feel like the pulse of the audience and the crowd here, at least the chat, 
says they will win as well. Creative Juice, I see your comment. I'm not going to read that until after we see the end of the first series. There is no need to get into that discussion, but we appreciate y'all, and we'll see you guys tomorrow on the Ultimate Cleveland Sports Show. Peace.